Hey, good morning, Intersection Church. Uh, my name is Derek Johnson. I'm a worship leader and worship pastor out in Sacramento, California, with the ministry Jesus Culture. And uh, your pastor, JD, reached out to me and asked if uh, if I'd be able to hop on and just lead some worship for you guys this morning. And um, and JD is such a good friend of mine. I've known him for a couple of years, and uh, I will say you guys are incredibly blessed to have JD as your pastor. He loves the Lord, just has an incredible story. And um, like I said, it's been a dear friend um, for me for a couple of years now. So I said, yes, I have to do it. So I am, I'm coming to you guys from my little home studio here um, in our own quarantine out here in California. Um, but I, there's a particular song I wanted to lead for you guys this morning. And, uh, and I really pray that it does encourage you and, and minister to you this morning and, um, and really ultimately turn your hope and your affections to the Lord in, in the middle of this kind of crazy time that we're going through. But this song's called The Way. Um, you guys have probably heard it. Uh, it's a Pat Barrett song, um, but it's one that I, I, I just can't stop singing. I love the words to this song. Um, and I, I really just believe it's this incredible reminder for all of us that even in the midst of everything that's going on, um, God doesn't change. God's promises do not change. God's heart towards us, um, it does not change. And so I, I love this song. I think it's such a song of hope. And I would even encourage you guys, um, after we sing it here this morning, um, to be you know playing this from home all week long and just really let um, the, the praise and the faith of this song wash over you guys this week. So... Um, Anyway, we're going to jump in.
Come on, that's our prayer this morning, God. Would you just remind us this week that that's exactly who you are? I love in the second verse of this song, it says, your provider, your protector. God, we just declare that no matter what's going on across the earth, God, across the nation, that you are our protector. You're our provider, God. And that's our prayer this week, Lord. That you would just silence all fear, all anxiety, God. I pray, God, you'd even cause each one of us to look back through our, our own story, our own testimony, and remember all the times that you've been the Savior, the Rescuer, the Provider, the Protector. And God, you would increase our faith. You would just increase our faith in this time. God, that you won't let us down. You won't forget us, God. You won't leave us by the wayside. But you are a God of breakthrough. You're the way. You're the truth in the life. Oh, I believe, I believe you are the way, the truth in the life. I believe you are. Well, hey, thanks, guys, uh, for inviting me into your living rooms, and um, I really pray you guys would have just an incredible Sunday, and um, yeah, it's an honor to get to worship with you guys this morning. Good morning, Intersection Church. Happy Palm Sunday. We are so excited you are joining us here today. My name is Rihanna, and if this is your first time joining us, we meet every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. For the next several Sundays, you can find us on Facebook, YouTube, and on our website, intersectionchurch.org. Also on our website, you can find our giving tab, where you can give your tithes and offerings online. Next Sunday, we would love for you to join us for Easter Sunday service. Also, we want this to be as interactive as possible, so don't be afraid to put those fire emojis, praying hands, and comments down below. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday and enjoy the message. Welcome friends and family. I'm so happy you guys could join us this morning. I know it's been several weeks since I've been able to get my hugs and see you guys face to face, but I am happy that we have technology where we can meet on these social platforms. You can find us on YouTube Live, you can find us on Facebook Live, Instagram, and we also have our web, new website that's up at intersectionchurch.org. So please feel free to follow us on all of those things. Check out our website. Um, but before I get started, I just want to take a moment of prayer to pray for everybody who's in the healthcare industry right now and all of our medical workers and first responders, because I think it's of the utmost important that we're keeping these people in prayer, as I know we have several people within our own church right now who are having to go into the hospital day in and day out and serve the people who are in need. So if you could just bow your heads wherever you are, whether you're on your couch, whether you're sitting at your kitchen table, or maybe you're still in bed enjoying your pillow, I just would like you guys to bow your heads with me. God, I just lift up every healthcare worker to you right now. God, I pray for a, a supernatural um, spirit of hospitality, a supernatural spirit of wisdom over each and every person who's taking care of these individuals, whether it's from a virus, whether it's to a recent cancer diagnosis, whether it's to babies that are being born, uh, whether it's an emergency, um, and all of those things, God, I'm asking that you equip our medical workers with strength. Um, I ask that you equip them with the mental capacity to be able to withstand this season, to withstand this time. I ask that you orchestrate their hands, orchestrate their feet, and that you will be the one that goes before them, that you will be the one that set the atmosphere through them, and that the people who are in that hospital can feel a sense of peace because of the people who are walking into those rooms. They're coming with a posture 
um, that, that is from you. They're coming with a posture of love. They're coming with a posture of connectivity. God, I ask for an anointing of family that starts to fill our hospitals where these people can feel like they are connected when their families can't be in the, actually be in the hospital room with them. God, I'm just asking that you allow that nurse to be the father's voice or the mother's voice, that you allow the doctor to be the voice of comfort that these people need when they're standing um, in abs- when they don't have, have the absence of a family member that can't be there. So God, we're just asking that you will be the, the father for them and that you will be the one that is sovereign over each and every one of those individuals who are in the uh, hospitals right now, God, and that you can bring peace to that situation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So I feel like the Lord has given me a word for you guys today. And the title of my message today is The Same Mountain, Different View. And I want to take us to Jerusalem. So the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains. Psalms 125 verse 2 says, As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forevermore. And so the city of Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains. And I've never been to Jerusalem before, but I have been to Boise, Idaho. And the city of Boise, Idaho sets at the base of the mountains. And I remember going there because I went to a bowl game for football. And I remember sitting in the stadium and I remember looking at the horizon and looking beyond the stadium and seeing mountains that were all around me and I was just in awe. And I really was in awe because of just how dwarfed I felt and how beautiful really the landscape was to be in the middle of something that was just so much bigger than me. And so I wanna take us, that's kind of probably the experience that if you were to sit in Jerusalem and you would see, and, and if you look beyond the horizon of Jerusalem, you would see these mountains and these mounds and these hills um, that went beyond the city walls. But one of those mountains that I want to talk to you about um, in particular is the Mount of Olives. As you all know, or maybe some of you don't know, we're celebrating Palm Sunday. And the Mount of Olives has a significant context to Palm Sunday. And I want to take us to Luke chapter 19, verse 28, starting at verse 28. And it says, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives. So to give you some context, um, up to this point, Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem for the Passover. Many of the Jewish people were making their pilgrimage to Jerusalem for the Passover. And as Jesus is on his way, he's going from village to village, and these different Jewish communities are seeing Jesus do these miracles. He's healing blind men. He's healing lame men. And one of his biggest miracles that he had just uh, performed is that he raised one of his best friends, Lazarus, from the dead. So Jesus is gaining this crowd as he's drawing near to Jerusalem, and he's making his way um, through Bethphage and, and Bethany. Um, And he's going through the mountain of olives and he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a coat tied there, which no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. So Jesus is strategizing on the mountain of olives with his disciples for his glorious entry. He's recognizing that people are starting to recognize him as the Messiah, as the Savior. And so he sits there with his disciples and talking with them. And he sends them out to go get a colt. And it says, those who were sent ahead went and found it, just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying this colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And Jesus told them, I tell you, he replied, If they keep quiet, the very stones 
will cry out. So Jesus travels down the mountain of Olives where he had just devised this plan to ride in on a donkey out of all animals where most kings would ride in on a horse or they would come in on a chariot. Jesus decides to use a donkey and this was to fulfill scripture. And so Jesus rides into Jerusalem after he had strategized with his disciples and there is just be glory being brought to his name. And the first thing he does is he goes to the temple and he starts to challenge the religious leaders. And he starts to condemn them for their doctrine. He starts to condemn them for their, for their laws that they have set up condemning people, not allowing them to truly be connected with God. And so this made them all upset and it made them all angry. And it said after Jesus would get done speaking at the temple, he would draw back out at the night and he would go back to the Mount of Olives. And it says day in and day out, he would do the same routine. He would go out and he would teach and he would heal and people would be in awe. But then all of a sudden, these religious leaders were able to plant uh, seeds of doubt into the people. And the fad of Jesus was over. It was like Jesus was a flash in the pan, like, yeah, we saw your miracles. We saw that trip. We've already saw you do all that before. And so people started to doubt and they started to listen to the religious leaders. And Jesus, seeing this, he started to see the shift in the culture. And whereas before, when he was on the mountain of all of strategizing for his triumphant entry with his disciples, now he's going back out with a different view. Where once he was preparing for glory, now he's seeing the culture starting to shift and now his prayers are changing. And since his prayers are changing and since his demeanor is changing, it's shifting his view, it's shifting his perspective. And that's what leads us to Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 44. And it says, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. So now Jesus is sitting in the garden of Gethsemane. He's on the same mountain, but he has a different view and he's sitting in the garden and he has a different perspective. And this is how we know where once he was preparing and asking his disciples to assist him, to bring him a cult for him to be glorified. Now his prayer is shifting. And this is what he says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Jesus is seeing the people who are now looking at him side eyed. He's seeing these people who are now looking at him in disgust. And he's starting to see that his end is drawing near. And he had already told his disciples that his time was going to come to an end. And he now sees that the culture is changing and shifting. His view is shifting. And he says, Father, if you can take this cup from me, how real is this that Jesus, knowing that he was sent to die, knowing that he was sent for this very reason, still goes to the Father in prayer, still goes to the Father in connection. And he says, Father, if you could take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And where once his disciples were assisting him. Now we see that this shift in this view has brought someone else to shifting him. That is someone else is assisting him. It says, and angels from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. So where once the disciples were assisting him, now angels are assisting him. Where once he was on a mountain, being prepared to be glorified. Now he is on a mountain, the same mountain, preparing to be crucified. But there's one thing that sustains him between these two mountain experiences on the same mountain. And it's very clear here. The one thing that sustained him through these two mountain experiences, one high, one low, was God's will. He prays to God and he says, God, not my will be done. But your will be done. I can remember growing up and going to my grandmother's house, my grandma Elma. I would walk in her house and I would go into the kitchen and I would smell the collard greens and the yams and the cornbread and, you know, all that good food. 
and I would sit and I would, and I would watch my aunt and uncles play cards and we would sit on the couch and we would watch TV and we would laugh and we would have these joyful experiences. But then if you cut the scene years later, now I'll go into my grandmother's house, but now it's a somber feeling. A week before I was on a missions trip and I hear that my father has passed away out of nowhere because of a heart condition that he knew nothing about. So I come back home and I remember driving to my grandmother's house. And there was a drive that I'd taken many times, roads that I went down many times in anticipation of going to my grandmother's house, going in anticipation of this glorious moment where I'm going to be able to eat her food, in anticipation of me being able to laugh and play with my cousins and talk with my uncles and my aunts and to have this time. But now the view has shifted. The atmosphere has shifted, and as I'm driving, my view and my perspective has now changed and I go into my grandmother's house and the same couch that I used to sit and laugh and play is the same couch that me, my aunts, my uncles and my cousins are mourning. Same house, different view. You see, COVID-19 has shifted our views. Where once our family looked like this, we have been now shifted to seeing a different view of our family in the context. You could have maybe got your, your, your job and you got cut from your job. You could have had a family member who has gotten sick. You could have had a married couple that comes into their home and they're trying to figure out how to have conversations that they haven't had to have before because now they're stuck in the house all day. Your finances have now shifted. The church has now shifted. COVID-19 has shifted a lot of things. Our relationships, the way we do friendships, the way we do life, the way we go out and about. But the one thing that COVID-19 hasn't done is that it hasn't shifted God's will. COVID-19 hasn't changed the strategy of God. And just as Jesus, his mountain experiences where his one mountain experience was for him to be glorified and his other mountain experience was preparing for him to be crucified, he relied on one thing. And it wasn't his own will. It was God's will. It was God's will that sustained him between these two mountain experiences. And it's going to be God's will that sustains us through these mountain experiences that we are having in our own lives in this moment and in this time. And you say, Pastor J.D., I don't even know what God's will is for my life. I don't know what God is calling me to do in this moment. I'm overwhelmed. I'm anxious. I don't know what to do in this moment. My whole perspective on life has shifted. My whole view on life has shifted. I don't even know what God's will is for my life anymore. Well, I want to tell you what God's will is for your life. God's will is that no man shall perish, but that every man will have everlasting life. He says it in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. It says, the Lord is not slow to keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Regardless you're at, if you're at the top of your mountain experience or whether you're feeling that you're at the lowest of your mountain experience right now, God's will is that everyone will be drawn to repentance and that everyone will be able to find their salvation in Jesus Christ. God's will is to be connected with you. God's will is to have a relationship with you. God's will is for you to have obedience in your life and to walk out your relationship with him. He will guide you. He will protect you. And just as Jesus left 
from that prayer, strengthened, knowing what he had to do. There is going to be a time where God is going to strengthen you in your darkest moment. And he's going to bring you through on the other side. And he's going to make you a witness to all those. After this COVID-19, he's going to bring us through this. But this is what he's going to do. This is what he's going to call us to. He's going to call us to be witnesses. He's going to call us to walk with a posture of love. He's going to call us to be disciples and to make disciples. Because that's his will for our life. He, don't want, he doesn't want us to be held captive to the mountain experiences and the different views that we have. But he wants us to walk by, by every word that he says. He wants us to walk in his will because his will won't change. Cultural change, our family dynamic will change, our economy will change, but God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, and he wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be connected with you. He wants to fill you with power and authority to make it through times like this. So if we could all just bow our heads. God, I ask that you just allow your Holy Spirit to invade every room, every listener. That your Holy Spirit will fill them and equip them in this moment. Regardless on what side of the mountain that they're on, that your Holy Spirit is equipping them to move and to live and to have their being, as you say in your word. That your Holy Spirit will give us the direction when we feel like we don't have direction. That, God, we will wait on you and we will listen to you as you work through our lives as you work through this pandemic, as you work through our job situations and our family situations and in our marriages and in our finances. God, you are the ultimate provider. God, you are Jehovah Jireh. God, we trust you. And we believe that you're going to bring us through this moment. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys so much for hopping on with us this morning. Um, I urge you guys to stay connected, whether it's through social media, whether it's through calling a friend, texting somebody, emailing, however you stay connected. I want to urge you to do that because we still need to be having conversations and growing our relationships deeper. And one way that we like to celebrate staying connected here at the Intersection Church is through communion. So if you have to run over to your kitchen and grab some bread and grab some wine or grape juice or some type of juice there, uh, I would like to have communion with you right now. So let's get started. So if you guys could take your bread, I'm going to take us to Luke chapter 22, verses 19, 19 through 20. It says, and he took the bread, gave thanks and broke it. And he gave to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. So I'm so thankful that you guys could take communion with me this morning. Remember, let's stay connected. Um, let's know that God is still reigning. He's still a sovereign, and his will is what sustains us not the current culture, climate, not our economics, and not our situations. Have a blessed day. Love you.